What's splashing? Welcome to season five, episode 12 of Siren Sundays. Yes, this is the finale with me, your host, Ashanti the Siren. This show has been focused on speaking with researchers, scientists, and practitioners of environmental science and all things conservation. You are now tuning into a conservation conversation. And today's guests are super special guests from Bark. We have Laura Kimball and Bonnie Young. Welcome. Thank you so much. We're so excited to be here. Yes, thank you so much. Like we're really, really excited and we can't wait to talk about our new mobile clinic with you. I'm excited too. But before we jump in, if you can just each take a turn and say, you know, who you are, what you what you do, and what your role is with Bark. I'm Laura. I'm the chairman of Bark. And um, so we we were formed in 2009 and, and here we are today. All right. So um, I'm Bonnie Young. I've been working in the animal care field, primarily with exotics for over 20 years, and I've been involved with lots of different conservation programs around the world. And I've taken a little bit of shift in focus and I've spent a lot of time volunteering with Bark in the I kind of started during Hurricane Dorian, I was still working at our Dastra Gardens. And, you know, just, you know, we had to help out with these all these animals. <laughs> that needed, you know, shelter that we were, you know, rescued from the islands. And, you know, then as I kind of changed my focus on what I was doing, I started spending a lot more time volunteering with Bark, and it's just such an amazing organization. And what they're doing, it still ties into what we're doing with conservation. And it's really, really important for the success of conservation programs throughout the Bahamas. So we're really excited to kind of show what we're doing and how it ties into to conservation programs. And, you know, so hopefully we'll all keep working together for a better Bahamas. Yes, I am excited. So I'm going to get your guys' slides up so we can start learning about Bark. All right, and let's get rolling. So I can start off with the beginning. So basically, Bark, as I mentioned a minute ago, we formed in 2009. Um, we're all volunteers. So this, um, we have just employed a new vet and vet assistant. So this is really new, having employees. We're from then till now, we've all just been volunteers. So it's a really incredible organization. See how we've how far we've come with volunteers, and you know we've just grown over the years, as you can see. We worked with um, Animal Balance, who are an incredible organization, and we really learned a lot from them. And we're so grateful for um, Emma Clifford from Animal Balance, and she's actually on our advisory committee. And we learned a whole lot in Operation Pocake, which was a coalition. Um, you guys probably remember it was a big thing in 2013, 2014, where we did tremendous amounts of spay and neuters. And it really helped us learn a lot to where we are today in the mobile clinic. And it was actually a big, like it was a big exercise in learning to know that the um, mobile clinic was the way to go. So it was really, really positive. And um, also in 2019, Bark was a huge integral part of the disaster relief efforts for animals in Abaco. Um, so we gained a lot of experience with that and again, made us feel confident to do this new part of our organization. So yeah, and here we are. Awesome, that is exciting. I'm gonna slide over to the next one. Well, you know, we know this is a conservation-based show and you might be saying, why the heck would we care about what's going on with domestic animals? And it is actually really important for the future of successful conservation programs because our domestic animals, the ones that we have as, as our pets and the ones that end up out on the streets or in the neighborhoods that, or are loosely owned really have a huge impact on our environment and how we manage that, you know, what we do is, you know, and how we manage our animals is going to you know, impact what happens to our environment as a whole. And if we are responsible pet owners, and if we manage our wild populations, you know, when we're talking about trying to save species, you know, we look at predator prey relationships, we look at the you know, habitats and environments as a whole. And these are part of that. So 
you know, domestic animals were introduced to the Bahamas. We know, you know, we don't typically think of dogs and cats as an invasive species because we love them so much. And, you know, we can't imagine our lives without them. And no one's going to say, just get rid of them. That's, that's not going to happen. You know, with any conservation program, we really end up looking at balance, right? So we want, you know, we need to think about how we balance what's going on, predator prey relationships. So our cats, you know, you think of them lying there on the couch or chasing their little toy mice around, but they are natural born instinctive hunters. The best thing you can do with a pet cat is keep it inside. <laughs> You know, make sure it has plenty of enrichment and make sure it has an active lifestyle, but they impact lots of prey species. Um, and then they also take, compete with local predators. So there's some places in the world where it's actually against the law to let your cat outside. Now, that's not something that we're advocating for necessarily. We know that, that you know, we, you know, that we have outdoor cats. We have a lot of feral cats. But it is something that's been done in other areas, particularly when they're really vulnerable birds, um, bird populations. And also our cats, unfortunately, can, um, you know, they can be help spread diseases, whether to other animals um, or, you know, between populations. So it's something that we can, you know, we think about. Our dogs, again, you know, they, they our dogs aren't, the greatest hunters compared to cats, <laughs> but they like to play with everything. So, you know, they are known for killing snakes and lizards. They are known for going after our shorebird, you know, particularly you see our lovely image of, you know, you go to the beach and the dogs see our, our shorebirds and the, the gulls and they're like, oh, it's so much fun. And it's like, oh, it's so cool. But then that's actually really detrimental to the, to the birds. Um, again, our dogs are so our potential um, vectors um, for disease, whether they're transmitting disease directly between other animals or because we have such hands-on relationships with them, whether they are introducing zoonotic diseases into our into our household. Things so a zoonotic disease would be a disease in another animal species that we are susceptible to as well. And you know, I'm sure you guys know about the dogs in the garden digging things up chewing on plants, you know, so they can impact our vegetation and our natural landscapes as well. So again, what do we do? Do we get rid of dogs and cats? No, of course, that's not the answer. <laughs> whether they're our pets, or whether they are, you know, our wild animals as well. So let's talk about, you know, some of these impacts and some of the ways that we can, you know, we can be more responsible when we think about animal management. So how do we become a responsible pet owner? So let's talk about our pets at home. Number one, please, please, please adopt. <laughs> there are so many animals that need loving homes that can be amazing pets. Don't encourage the breeders. These, you know, breeders in general, there are, are, there are some that are very responsible, but in general, breeders are out to make money. They are not looking at necessarily the overall welfare of the animals. They're not looking at, you know, what do they do when the animal's no longer of use to them? Do they still give it a loving home or do they chuck it out on the street? Um, what do they do with the puppies that don't get sold? You know, it with, or the kittens. There are so many animals in the Bahamas Humane Society, in foster programs throughout the Bahamas, throughout the world that need loving homes. So the best thing we can do is get as, you know, get as many of these kittens that are taken off the street and become friendly, you know, give them a chance rather than paying a breeder. Um, so by providing loving homes for animals, one, we're getting them off the street, we're getting them off the shelter, and we're discouraging breeding and overpopulation, you know, and, and discouraging people for just breeding these animals just for the sake of it. Um, so number one, yes, please, please, please do adopt. Then get your animal spayed or neutered as soon as possible. <laughs> you don't want surprises. Every so often, you know, you think, oh, they're not old enough yet, or, oh, I keep them inside. Mistakes happen, especially when the hormones kick in. You're like, my cat's only inside, but that, that one time they sneak out the door and they show up three days later and then, oh, surprise. 
do you have 15 people that you know who want a kitten? And if you don't, what happens to the other 12? So getting your pets spayed as soon as they are physically able to is really, really important. Ideally, again, keeping our cats inside. Then they can't kill things <laughs> or they're only killing things in your house. If they're in your house, I guess technically fair game. You know, my cat, when it kills the cockroaches, not so upset. <laughs> if he finds a mouse, not so upset. Now, of course, if he finds a lizard, he finds a frog, I do my best to make sure I get to it before he does and then we get it back outside. Um, so, you know, we try to keep our cats inside. A really awesome thing, it's a big trend, is creating what we call catios. So having an outdoor space for your cat, but that's enclosed. So they can still have that enrichment, they can still interact with the natural world, but they can't go on murdering sprees, um, <laughs> for lack of a better term. And you know, so it also protects your cat because prey animals fight back, other cats fight back. So your cat's going to be much healthier. They still have that natural stimulation. They can still hunt things, but they just can't actually get to them. And so it's a good way to protect the environment and your cat. If you do want to take your cat out, out, it's actually not very hard to train your cat to walk on a leash. It's probably easier than training your dog, especially if you start young. Your cats love going out on a leash. There's, I know there's people who are doing that already around the island. So it's a really great way to let your cats get that outside experience, interact with the world, have that enriching um, interaction, but you're in control. So if they start stalking something, you know, they yeah, give them a little time to do a little stalking, get a, a pounce in, but don't let them actually catch the bird. Don't let them catch the lizard. Um, and, you know, it's so it's 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 a win win. Uh, yeah, I was just <laughs> going to say, and I actually saw a comment come in saying something similar. I always thought it was a joke when people would say you can walk a cat on a leash and seeing this picture and of course as i've gotten older it's one of those things where it's like why do we why are we comfortable walking dogs on a leash but not our cats when our cats are more of the ones that need that like restriction so it's, it's nice that you noted that and hopefully pet owners will do that yeah, and if, especially if you get a kitten, you start them start them young. It's part of the thing. You know, I had a foster kitten. It was a bottle baby, and as soon as it's you know had some shots, you know, I took it <laughs> pretty much everywhere with me. It went to the beach. It went, you know, out and about. But it was on a harness, so it learned that it could explore different areas. It and it could you know do interact in different ways, but you know, it wasn't going to be able to do any damage. Um, and then, you know, we know a lot of people, you, you know, let's say your cat's 12 years old, it's been living outside all its life, nine years old, you try to put a harness on it. Or, you know, some of our cats aren't as super friendly. You know, they're not going to be, you know, we have yard cats. We know that that's a thing. So one thing you can do that studies have shown is the more the more audible and visible your animal is, the less successful they are going to be as a predator. So, you know, instead of putting a tiny, you know, making sure they have some kind of collar on them, but ideally it's kind of a big one, like actually scrunchies or something with big poofy things, it makes your cat much more visible to prey items. Instead of having one teeny little bell or nothing, put like a bell, if your cat's a big prolific hunter, five, six bells on that thing <laughs> to make it so that they can't sneak up on something. It I'm really, those really cats hate their owners. <laughs> and they put all those bells. <laughs> yes. And one of my cats, he's figured out how to squish the bells so they don't ring. Um, <laughs> so we're constantly replacing collars, but again, that's part of us being, being responsible is we're trying to make them you know, we're trying to give the prey the best chance they can to get away. And of course, vaccinating our animals, making sure that they are protected. It's for the welfare of your cat, but it also helps them from spreading diseases amongst their population and to other animals as well. Toxoplasmosis in particular is one that we hear about with cats. 
and it has not here so much in the Bahamas, but there are a lot of mammalian species that are highly, highly susceptible to toxoplasmosis um, that, again, our cats are carriers. It doesn't make them sick, but they can pass it along. Different parasites. So see your veterinarian regularly. Make sure you can do them preventative parasite treatments on a monthly basis. Keep your cats vaccinated and healthy. That's going to help that spread of disease. And by having a healthy population, that's going to help protect other animals and wildlife as well. So those are some, like, some of our tips that we would encourage people as cat owners to really follow. And of course, we have some recommendations for our dog owners as well. A lot of them are going to be similar. <laughs> Once again, with our dogs, don't adopt or don't buy. Please, please, please. We need you to adopt those dogs. We know there's so many, so many animals that are just fantastic dogs that need homes. And people say, oh, well, we'll just get them on the airlift. You know, there's places that need dogs. They need dogs in the shelter. So I'll just take, you know, I'll let my dog have puppies and it'll get sent out to Canada where they need them. We have more than enough. We have more than we can handle going on these airlifts. The Humane Society is like over three times its capacity, almost four times its capacity. If there was no breeding of any dogs on this island for a, a full year, we would still have way more animals than our, our island can really can handle. So no, we don't need to breed any animals. We don't want to encourage the breeding of, animal, of, of dogs. So please adopt. And once again, spay and neuter, make sure we're not having any unplanned puppies. Uh, again, you know, a litter might be two, it might be 11 or 12. That's a lot of animals. And again, do you have 12 people that you know are gonna want one of your puppies if your dog has one? And if you don't, what's gonna happen? Dumping things at the Humane Society just is not a sustainable solution. Sending animals out of the country is not a sustainable solution. It's so expensive and it just, it's not solving the problem. It's actually almost facilitating the problem and we don't want that. Um, so what can we do about making sure our dogs interact with our wildlife safely? Ideally, dogs should be in an enclosed yard. One, it's, again, it protects your animal. We want to keep your animal nice and safe. But now they have their space. And animals do learn, okay, there's a, there's a predator here. And they might not visit as much, but it protects those animals. They have a way to get, you know, they have a, your, your dog has a barrier. So the birds have a place to get away from the dog. The lizards have a place where they're safe. The snakes have a place where they're safe as well. So whenever possible, make sure you have an enclosed yard for your dog, or if you're taking your dog out of your personal property, make sure they're on a leash. Again, dogs are so easy to leash train. They love going for walks. They love exploring, um, but do it responsibly. You know, make sure that they're not just chasing the other animals across the road. You know, one, it's gonna keep them safe. They're not less likely to get hit by a car. Um, and it protects the other animals in your neighborhood. Now we had, you know, when I was working at Ardastra, we had one of our lizards was named Pego. She's a green iguana and she was somebody's pet and the neighbor's dog got into their yard and attacked the iguana. Now we won't go into the fact that the iguana shouldn't have been there in the first place. <laughs> we could say it was a rabbit. We could say it was someone else's pet or some other type of animal, but the owner of the dog didn't have their dog under control. It got into it. It wasn't you know, in their own space. It got into a neighbor's space and severely injured this animal. This animal lost multiple, you know, lost a foot, lost multiple toes, has, you know, some major scar, you know, has residual health impacts 12 years later. <laughs> These guys live a long time. Um, and that's something that completely could have been avoided if the dog was on a leash. So again, not the greatest example because a green iguana really isn't something that we should be having as a pet here as, since they are another invasive species. But again, if that was your, your pet rabbit, if that was your cat, if that was your other, another dog, if that was your child, that would be a big deal. So we do need to be responsible. If we're taking our dog off of our property, we need to be in control of that animal at all times. 
And I, I do want to add um, and a good comment from my lovely veterinarian, Dr. Delant. It's also important to license your dogs annually. And I think a lot of people don't realize you actually need to be licensing your dogs. So uh, as a friendly reminder for all pet owners, license your dogs annually. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, you know, it's, it's the law. It's the requirement. We'll mention that also with our vaccine when we talk about vet, uh, the vet side of things. And then also clean up after your dog. When you take your dog out for a walk, if you leave their feces lying there, that's going to be a really easy way for diseases to spread. If your dog has worms, then not someone else walks by, they track that in their house or another animal comes by and they, you know, it's, it's really important in terms of health and, san and sanitization. So we know dogs can spread diseases. They are vectors. They can also transmit things directly to us or to other animals. But we can do a huge amount of mitigation with that by just properly disposing of our animals excrement. Just like, you know, we're not going and you know, leaving some boo-boo in the bush, you don't want to do, <laughs> let your dog do that either, <laughs> you know? It's it's not clean and more, we're, resp again, responsible. Get that in the trash where it can be disposed of properly. Very important. And again, keeping our animals healthy. If they're healthy, they're most going to be much less likely to be carriers and spread diseases to us, to other animals. So making sure they're vaccinated, we're using a par parasite preventative, getting them to the vet, getting them licensed and registered, you know, also making sure our animals are microchipped. So again, you know, this isn't really part of the conservation side of things, but it's important, you know, if you have a microchip, you're linked to that animal. And if they end up in the shelter, oh, this one's microchipped, we can figure out who, you know, you're more likely to get your animal back. So it's super important with our all of our pets that we really give them that protection. So what about all of the strays. <laughs> we know we see the packs of pot cakes, you see the wild pot cats dashing through the bushes. This is one of the reasons that we really want to reduce the number of unplanned animals throughout the islands. In the United States, they're estimating that about 2.4 billion birds are killed by cats every year. Now, coming up with this data is very, very tricky. There's lots of different studies. There's have different degrees of rigor that have been done and whatnot. So, they, so this data is taken from a large number of studies around the world and kind of extrapolated. That's why we have this nice bell curve. So with the projections from several hundred different studies kind of came up with this median estimate of at least you know, about 2.5 billion birds are killed by cats on an annual basis. That's a lot. That adds up. If you think an individual cat, in general, it's estimated that, a, you know, oh, and again, this is not your house cat that never leaves. It's not one that you're managing properly. You're not you being a responsible pet owner but it's your wild cat that never comes in. It's the cats roaming your neighborhood. On average, cats kill one to one and a half birds a week. And I go, you know, that, like, that's not so bad, right? One bird. I felt like it was but gonna be more. I feel like I've seen cats are very it, it, vicious. <laughs> they, well, that's global, like it's kind of a global average. Some don't have a lot of birds to prey on. Others have a lot of other food sources. So when you average that all out, you say, oh, that's not a big deal. Who cares if we lose one bird a week? Birds probably die more frequently. But when we look at that total for the year, so now we're looking at 50 to 75 birds a year. Okay, that's a bigger number, but you have 10 cats in your neighborhood. So now that's 500 to 70, 750 birds just on your street. Then we expand that now we've got a thousand cats in one section of the island. So we're looking at 50,000 to 75,000 birds in a year from a thousand cats. Those numbers grow <laughs> very, very quickly. So again, if there's lots of rats about, maybe they're not going after as many birds, but just anecdotally speaking with um, a local community in Andros, you know, they're talking about that 
pretty much the cat's population has grown so large that they've pretty much eradicated the rats. Whoa, yes, amazing. We've gotten rid of an invasive species. But now those wild cats need another food source. And they mark, noted a significant decline in their bird population in the last two years. Just again, not a, not a formal study. This is just their personal observations. And there's nothing restricting the breeding of those cats. So that's where these spay and neuter, neuter programs are so, so, so important. If we're losing 50 birds a year, that's not a big deal. But if that one cat has, we'll go into the kind of the data of how frequently these animals reproduce those populations can grow exponentially very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, our last, this last slide is always about um, the number. So we see like our little gr small gray um, <laughs> uh, curve is the number of birds killed by cats in a year. And in the US, they're estimating 12.3 billion rodents are killed by cats in a year or mammals, not just rodents, mammals. So again, if they're invasive species, we're like, yeah, that's a great thing. But when they're endangered Key Largo wood rats, they're endangered cotton mice, they're different types of gerbils and juvenile rabbits and you know native species, we don't necessarily think that's such a great thing. So- And I do wanna <laughs> interject, even like the the endemic hutina that we have, that I think is now also at Adestra. I'm pretty sure um, in Mayaguana I visited, they believe that you know they have so many feral cats that that's why they don't see the hutia anymore. They're like, you will literally be driving down the street and you'll see cats coming out of the bush. Like, and I was like, wow, this is a lot. Um, and we do have a, que a relevant question right now asking, do cats actually eat these rats? And I think that is a good question because oftentimes I always imagine that cats play with them and then they'll kill them. But are they, they are, them. are they actually eating these rats? It depends on the cat. Um, some of them, particularly some of the the fair, more the more feral cats that don't have alternative food sources, will actually eat the rats. Um, from firsthand experience, I know when I find just a rat head um, and the few entrails that the rest was eaten. Um, so again, it depends on the cat. I also have a cat that is pers that is absolutely terrified of anything that moves and ran away terrified from a day old baby chick. So each cat's a little different. Um, so yes, there are, there are some cats that are definitely hunters and hunt to eat. There are others that hunt and because they are well fed, it becomes just a toy. Um, and those are the ones that like to leave the carcass in fun places for you to find five days later. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and we haven't even talked about the reptiles. There isn't a lot of data on the interaction between our domestics and our reptiles. So, you know, looking at these numbers, it's like, well, shouldn't we just get rid of these animals? Don't we just want to get rid of all these dogs and cats? Well, I think we get a lot of pushback saying, no, we love them. <laughs> they, they've become such an integral part of our lives. And yes, they are important to us. And, you know, actually, if you go on to the next slide, you'll, you know, left unchecked, these populations can explode so quickly. Uh, you know, in our first slide, we mentioned back in, I think it was about 2014, 2015, there was a large distemper outbreak throughout the islands. And we lost a lot of dogs in the, in the shelters and on the streets. There was a huge vaccination campaign, but the, the dog population got knocked back significantly. But now it's growing again. Um, <laughs> you know, we've got these animals, you know, we have healthy animals and, you know, we've been able to get this disease kind of knocked back a little bit. And so we have, you know, people who have let, or let their dogs just run wherever or aren't getting their animals fixed. You know, you've got two dogs within five years that though they can be directly responsible for the production of six, seven, 67,000 animals. Now, most likely they're not all gonna, they might not all survive to reproductive age, but that's huge. Um, you know, and Laura, if you want to talk, you know, since you've really been working in this 
you know, in the Bahamas and on the islands with the spay and neuter programs, you probably have seen firsthand a lot more what happens when populations are left unchecked, when populations are severely decimated like they were in Hurricane Dorian, and what happens when we have these trap neuter return or trap neuter release programs and how that affects the overall long-term stability of these populations. Yeah, I can comment to that. So, I mean, of course, people, um, you know, there have been the situation. So as you were talking, Bonnie, earlier, oh, well, why don't we just remove the cats? You know, um, there was an example of a popular golf course that they had like cats that were had been spayed and neutered and, you know, they were maintained and whatnot. And somebody came in and decided to remove them. Well, unfortunately, when rats started running through, um, they decided that, oh, maybe it's not so bad to have the cats around the golf course and the cats came back. So that was, you know, example of like the rats and keeping them away. Um, a lot of hotels we've worked with over the years, you know, first of all, the hotels will have the approach, oh, let's get rid of the, the cats and they remove them. Um, and then they do see other problems. So luckily, a lot of the hotels have worked with us to maintain their cat population so they're healthy and it's not unmanageable. They're spayed and neutered. And, um, you know, so we mentioned here the vacuum effect because that's what people think like, oh, we'll just go and call and remove the animals from a situation. And it never actually works. It's been proven all across the world with lots of organizations that work on spay and neuter. Um, that as soon as you do that, you actually just like create an explosion because there's a certain amount of resources and food that we're maintaining a population from before. And so, you're, I mean, one, you're never gonna remove them all. You can never get 100% and whichever, whoever's left, it's just gonna explode. And we saw that firsthand with Dorian, like, Don, like Bonnie mentioned. Um, we were in there, it was September, by that we had our first responders on the ground, you know, rescuing whatnot. And they were in there about a month to six weeks. We were already seeing the surviving animals were pregnant and explode like popular, like they were just starting to give birth so quickly. Yeah. Because that's just like nature taking care of itself. So then we went in by through November and December, we did quite a lot of Spain. We did every Sunday we were flying up there. I think it was and we spayed and neutered about 200 plus um, on day clinics. So it was it was really good, but it was interesting for us to see what we'd read about the vacuum effect firsthand and how it really, really happened. So that is why Bark just believes so fully in responsible pet ownership, spay and neuter, and just getting the population under a managed you know number and just educating people about spaying and neutering their pets so that we can have a healthy animal population. And so just curious before we move on, and hopefully I'm not jumping ahead. Um, so you guys capture the stray animals, neuter them, and then return them where you found them. Yeah, yeah. Base, I mean, so the, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we, whenever we're working with dogs and cats, they have a food source. We would never take an emaciated, sick, like dying looking dog and take it off the street. One, it, you know, it's not healthy enough for surgery. Um, but you know, of course, if it's in a really bad way, we would figure out what to do with it at that point. Um, if it's too sick, um, you know, and suffering humane euthanasia, or if we can, I mean, we've had some amazing rescue cases where we think that they're on, like, I mean, they really are on death's door and they come back and they're beautiful, beautiful, um, dogs and, you know, mostly dogs. Um, and so, but yes, so what we'll do is we pick them up, we spay or neuter them and return them because really they have a, a relatively good life. Um, they have a food source. They typically have someone that cares for them, that watches out for them. It's not, you know, what we would expect or hope for our dogs who, you know, are in the house or whatnot, but it's, it's a good life. And we don't see that they should be euthanized or anything like that. They're living a qual like enough quality of life. Yeah, I definitely am in my neighborhood, which is near a beach. We have a few dogs that I believe are living the dream because they somehow they're fed. I think some neighbors feed them, but they also find food sources and they just are chill out on the beach all day. And that's their life. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. And I mean, they and it's also really nice. I mean, um, we have a couple of volunteers that are out there in the community. And, you know, you, you when I'm with them, too, it's like you stop and there's like 
people don't have necessarily that much either, but they really love these animals. And, you know, they're the dogs there hanging out with them on the corner or by the basketball court or whatever it is. And, you know, it's a companionship. So, you know, we're, we're there to help protect that and also help that dog because spaying and neutering it allows them to be healthier because, you know, when a mummy dog or, or female dog is giving birth every six months, it's just so depleting to her. But if she's spayed and then she doesn't have to worry about taking care of her babies, she can live a really healthy, you know, good life. So <laughs> this is where we're going now. Um, so this is really exciting. So um, over the last 12 years, we've grown steadily with our spay and neuters per year. Um, 2021, we got up to over 3,000, which was our biggest number. Um, but with the mobile clinic, which is literally a, an operating theater on wheels, um, we hope to do about 5,000 to 7,000 spay and neuters a year. So this is that's this, exciting. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, so this is, we literally got our mobile clinic off the dock on March 21st. And, um, you know, we've been getting it, um, our vet and uh, vet assistant have been working to get it together. And, um, you know, uh, Bonnie's been volunteering. I've been down there, Lissa, like, you know, we're all getting it operational. So it's very exciting. And so and here's Dr. Jen, this is our new vet. Um, so this is how it's all gonna work. Um, we have, we're gonna be starting in the communities right now. Like I said, we're getting, you know, testing it out, getting everything in a flow, uh, cause it's a lot of work to get a whole new, you know, clinic up and running. And by hopefully April 20th after Easter, we'll start in the communities um, and we'll be working five days a week. And we hope to do 20 to 30 surgeries a day and we think our first location will probably be somewhere in Centerville and then Fox Hill. Um, we've already spoken to Lowe's Wholesale about their location um, on Soldier Road. So we'll be sharing with the public where we'll be and, you know, how you can book appointments. So, of course, it's for people who can't necessarily afford to spay and neuter their pets. Um, if you can afford to, we encourage you to go still to a private vet. Awesome. And so we do have a question about the clinic. Um, will this be going to the family islands? Yes, not right away. Um, <laughs> we're really excited. Um, we anticipate, we did a lot of work in Eleuthera um, in 2021. And um, actually Bonnie volunteered on quite a few clinics there. And then Lissa, who's the vice chairman of BART, she ran those clinics. So we've done a significant amount of work there. We did over I think in total, like 760 something spay and neuters in Eleuthera so far. So we hope that in November, um, we'll start there. And then we hope each year to add and, and really work through. We definitely want to go to Andros. Um, Inagua desperately needs help. Um, so yes, we will be getting to the family islands, but we really need to, to get some leeway here in Nassau because it's pretty, pretty crazy. So here we go. So um, our overall goal, like I mentioned, is the five to 7,000 spay and neuters a year. And the other really exciting thing is the education opportunities that this brings. Um, being in the, in the communities on the weekends, we'll be there Saturday and Sunday. And we've done MASH clinics and the kids are so interested. You know, they'll, I mean, they're going to see this big colorful van and they're going to come out and we are going to have um, opportunities for kids to learn about how to take care of their pets. And we're just really excited about all the opportunities it's going to bring for that. So it's really, really positive. I had this amazing, I mean, oh my gosh, we were in East Street. I can't even remember when we did a clinic and literally like probably two to three years later, I got a call from uh, this little boy's grandmother and he, and like, so basically she had, I think he got my number from someone. Anyways, the dog was going with him to a family island and he said, Grammy, I can't take the dog until I have her spayed. And we like and this little boy remembered us being in the community and insisted that this dog was spayed before he went to the family island. Like it was just incredible. And so to me, that just is like the story that gives you hope. And that's where, you know, we got to work with the kids. 
Yeah, because I think, and even just highlighting that, the biggest issue is access. You know, like this is definitely going to create more access to people who can afford it and who want to, you know, you want to help with the problem. Because as we've seen, like we have a lot of dogs and cats in the street. Um, And I think even just with the education programs, I'm excited to see the increase in veterinarians that come out of this, because now you're giving these children a firsthand look at, at what this work is like, who normally probably would never even set foot into an actual vet clinic. So I'm excited for you guys. <laughs> yeah, we're really, really excited. And during COVID, because we were doing, you know, school visits and stuff. And then during COVID, we um, wrote a coloring book. <laughs> um, Shelly, one of our volunteers, put together a story. And, you know, we we put, we put, we worked with IFA, who we formed a really good relationship during Dorian. Um, and they helped, the, you know, with the expenses of printing it. And yeah, so that was really good. So we were, we're going to have all kinds of opportunities and activities for kids. We're probably going to work with the Rotary Clubs and uh, Kiwanis for, you know, extra volunteers. They can come out and run the program. So, and we're just, and also just being there on the Saturday and Sunday, um, you know, the private practices, the vets work really, really hard during the week and they need some time off on the weekends, but people can't really take their dogs and usually during the week because they're working hard. So um, it'll give a good opportunity for people to get their animals to the vets. And, um, you know, we taking this on, as I sort of mentioned in the beginning, I mean, it's a it's a big step. And we knew how hard it was going to be. Um, it's, it's not easy. But with all of our experience through Operation Pot Cake and, um, you know, because we're basically taking our operating budget of, a, you know, maybe 200000 dollars up to we're anticipating close to seven hundred thousand dollars operating expenses i mean you know it's a learning curve of course but it's a big thing and and we're also i mean you know we're just we're volunteers but we're taking on staff and the responsibility so it's it's a big step but we felt confident with everything we've learned that we can do it and we've we've made amazing connections and uh you know we work closely with the humane society um, and other organizations. So I think it's, it's the right time. And, you know, it's just, I guess, sort of, we felt that it was amazing when the Ron Ulrich called or when we were, you know, sitting and talking and he says, okay, what will it take to make a huge change? And he said, I will buy this mobile clinic. We were like, okay, we're ready. Let's do it. Lovely. Mm -hmm. So this is basically our five-year plan. Um, you know, it's it's um, basically, you know, here we are um, bringing in the mobile clinic. It's a learning curve. And then over the next few years, we're just going to grow. And we hope within five years to really see a different Bahamas. And, you know, our goal is to see the Humane Society uh, a couple days ago had to close um, surrenders because there's no space for them. They're over, I think Fiona said, 500, I don't know, Bonnie might remember, like over 500, close to 600 animals. And really their capacity should be like 250 animals. So, um, so yeah, there's just too many. So please spay and neuter your pets. So, and then this is just, this is where I feel I'm, I'm the efficient person. I'm like, I'm all about like, how do you, you know, and, and when Bark started, we were, we started to lobby the government pound. And um, when we're, you know, meeting with everybody and it was like, and, and most people don't even remember this because it was in 2009 and, and it was the end of the road. And I'm like, what, what, what are we doing here? Like, this isn't the root of the problem. And we're so passionate about spay and neuter. And Bonnie was mentioning the airlifts, which are not sustainable. I mean, people just don't, I mean, it takes those volunteers because it's mostly volunteers that make those flights happen because the staff at the Humane Society are working, they're drowning, trying to keep just the daily care of the animals and the organization and what it takes to prepare each animal. Because when you send those animals off, they have requirements. They have to be heartworm negative. They have to be spayed. They have to be this. They have to be that. And they have all of these requirements. And so sometimes it's two months of treatment. You know, it's just insane amounts of work. And then let, let alone the cost of the flight, which is like $35,000 for the plane. So each animal you're looking at a cost of like one puppy when you rescue that puppy and the shots and the time and the food and the vet care and everything is thousands of dollars. Whereas you spay and neuter one dog or cat and, you know, it's less than $100 depending. But, you know, even if you use that as, a, you know, $100 is an easy figure. 
for, and then you're preventing the birth of so many, like that's the efficient use of donor dollars right there. So that's what we're really passionate about. So Bonnie can jump in. So, so you know, prevent, so like we said, we, we're not saying, you know, we don't want to get rid of the dogs and cats. We love our dogs and cats. We encourage people to, to have dogs and cats, be responsible pet owners and help us be part of the solution. You know, we need to stop. We don't like seeing animals that are suffering out on the street. We don't like, you know, you know, knowing that there's large quantities of animals that are potentially having negative impacts in our neighborhoods. But again, it's not humane to just go out there. We, we never, never, never would encourage anyone to just like, oh, well, let's just go get rid of that. We want to do the responsible thing that's responsible, you know, the, the most humane thing for those animals, for our wildlife, for our communities is to prevent unplanned pregnancies in these animals. So, you know, what we're doing here with Bark, it's, it is so important. It's great work. And it, again, it's important for the long-term conservation of our wildlife, of our native habitats throughout the Bahamas and creating a more humane environment for all of our, all of our animals. So again, it's, this is expensive. <laughs> it is the most cost-effective solution. And it's also one of the most effective, you know, pretty much the trap to release program with the strays. You know, Laura mentioned getting our clinic into the communities and people being able to make appointments for their own pets, but our volunteers are also still going to be continuing our trapping programs. So if, you know, someone has 20 cats coming to their yard when they know, you know, we're going to be coordinating all these calls with these you know, stray dot stray animal populations so that our volunteers are going to be helping to get them into through our program as well. Uh, so then, you know, at least that stops the growth of those populations. And we, you know, we need help to make this happen. We've had some incredible, amazing donors um, that have supported Bark over the years um, and continue to support Bark. Yeah, but, you know, this is, it's something that it needs to be part of the whole community. You know, everybody, every dollar makes a difference. We know we all have our different passion projects. We all have things that we care desperately about. Uh, but this is something where, you know, the reach isn't just, okay, we're just helping this person's pet. We're just helping this one person. We're really trying to have a huge positive impact on, you know, communities all across the Bahamas. You know, so, you know, for our researchers out there, you know, you have a study area and there's an issue, you know, again, we've got a mobile clinic down the road, you know, let's, let's talk about how does this fit into grant funding is that, you know, is TNR a viable solution, you know, a, something that we can consider in conjunction with other conservation programs with it, you know, within your study area. And we can try to build that funding and partnership together from the beginning of a project. You know, so there's a lot of ways where what we're doing with the right, you know, with the right backing and with continued support can really have a huge widespread impact all throughout our, you know, different communities in the Bahamas for people and wildlife. Thank you. And that was, I just want to throw in there, I'm sorry, that was a picture of um, Ron, our, our donor who bought us the mobile clinic. And, um, and that's Blake. And he was, we don't have a before picture on here. This is an after picture. Um, but honestly, he was in such bad shape. And, you know, while Bark is not, we don't, we're not a rescue organization. What we want to see is the fact that the numbers come down and that is manageable for the animals that can be like, there's so many dogs and cats that need help that could be rescued and the resources are just so slim. But if we can, you know, get the population to a manageable number, then we can rescue so many more. And the, you know, the dogs at the Bahamas Humane Society who are aggressive, they can have like dog trainers come in and people work with them or, you know, you just have more time for each individual animal. And it just becomes like, you know, a manageable situation, which we're not at right now. You know, I do love the idea that that you can get trainers in to help with those aggressive animals, because 
I personally know a handful of trainers who I'm sure can volunteer their time to do this because that is true. Some of the things that make these animals un unadoptable are because they are aggressive when really they're just not conditioned. They're very scared of humans and, and no one has shown them love and they don't even know how to receive that. So that is amazing. I hope anyone watching who knows trainers, like consider asking them to reach out to the Humane Society and, and talk about training some of these animals that are considered um, aggressive and unadoptable. Because I believe, unlike humans, I feel like, yes, we're all good intentioned. I believe every dog is purely good and, and they do not want to hurt people. It's just they had a hard upbringing. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and honestly, if anybody listening to this, if they want to go and help at the Humane Society, just like the enrichment factor, right? They're, the staff are so, I mean, all they can do is to get through and clean the cages. And so people don't get to spend a lot of time with these animals. So even if you went for an hour to spend time with two dogs, like half an hour with each dog, that's going to make a massive difference in these animals' lives. So, yeah. So, yeah, you know, we we're, we're definitely still looking for funding to help make sure our programs are going to be long term and sustainable. Uh, we have lots of different donor, you know, donor opportunities. Um, we kind of have our Stop the Suffering campaign going on, of course. So this will be directly funding what we're doing with the mobile clinic, making sure we are able to get out in the communities, funding our education programs and you know, we've talked about the Humane Society quite a bit in partnership. And one of the things that we, you know, part of our education program is teaching people about the resources that they already have within their community, where they are, how they can access them, but then also giving back a little bit. Uh, one, we have, you know, activities where the kids will be able to take some things home for their own animals that they can make to give their animals a more enriching experience. But then they can also make these things for the animals at the Humane Society. So trying to create a more enriching experience in making these animals more adoptable. So again, all these, any funding that we, we get that goes directly towards these programs. So whether it's a service organization committing to doing, you know, one Saturday, a quarter with working in the education programs or um, an individual donor who wants to support a specific piece of equipment or a certain number of, you know, certain number of days of surgery or whatnot. All of that is so, so, so important for making sure that this program is going to be just be as successful as we know that it can be. All right. Yes. Thank you all so much for listening and participating. <laughs> As you can see, we are just so excited with, you know, what this mobile clinic means for, for animals in the Bahamas. And like you said, it's not just the dogs and cats that are going to benefit for, from this. It's going to be, you know, it's going to have a widespread lasting impact. And especially with the education side on you know, just how hopefully, you know, how people view animal welfare and um, interacting with animals. And, you know, it's going to be just such a great supplement to the work that's being done by the National Trust with your education programs, by our Dostra Gardens, by Brief, you know, by having these different ways to connect with different types of animals. We're going to have, you are know, just going to be growing generations of people who really you know understand the importance of um, animal welfare and healthy environments and it all ties together definitely awesome thank you guys so much but i do before we go and in closing um i do have just a quick question um, for you both to answer well, one or the other just so if viewers want to get involved what is the best way to contact you guys well, um, so on the Bark website, we do have sort of like get involved kind of page um, and you can send a, you know, contact me, kind of, you know, contact us form. Um, but if you're specifically interested in getting involved with the mobile clinic and being one of our volunteers, we are going to have limited numbers of volunteers that are going to be hands on. Um, helping the vet staff, you know, not, you're not in doing surgeries. <laughs> Don't want to put that, that's, that's not going to happen. The vet will be doing their surgeries, 
but uh, you know assisting and supporting the vet team um, whether you know assisting with um, overseeing our recovery process or patient intake um, we have you know quite a quite a few ways that people can support the whole process directly um, or if you're interested in assisting with the education programs or interested in you know as a community organization kind of coming in and helping put on one of the education programs on weekends again we have it all kind of scripted out for you so yeah you can email me directly <laughs> so it's bonnie at barkbahamas.org and we will right now again we're we're taking things slow um we're making sure that the staff is able to you know flow and all the equipment's working the way it's supposed to and kind of figuring out the general process of how things are going to work um, before we start adding people into the mix. But we are in the process. We definitely want to get the community involved. We want volunteers in there helping with uh, helping us. You know, we're looking at, you know, especially any students who are interested in uh, veterinary medicine as, as a career or working with animals as a career having um, opportunities for one-on-one -on -one direct learning. Um, we're already talking with um, our Daster Gardens and Broad Reach, which it, that runs a experiential learning introductory vet medicine program about how we can help rotate their students through the mobile clinic so they can see hands-on how it works and what you know what's going on. So we 100% support the whole hands-on learning and experiential learning side of things. So again, send me an email if you're interested in being in, in getting involved. So you can go to the BARC website, barkbahamas.com, or um, email me directly, bonnie at barkbahamas.org. Awesome. And so just a final question for you guys. If you can give a bit of inspiration or just final thoughts for our viewers, what would it be? I'll let Laura go first. Oh boy, on the spot. Um, I mean, I I guess I mean the what is the Mahatma Gandhi's quote quote, um, the greatness of a nation can be judged and its moral progress can be judged on the way it treats its animals. And I think that a lot of people always are like, Oh, you guys are doing all this for the animals and whatnot. And you know, when kids learn to be compassionate towards animals. And the, it, like that carries on into like just when they grow up, you know, so it's not like just, I mean, yes, I love dogs and cats so much. I mean, I always, I want to help them all, but for those people who don't see that, you know, and, and they don't really understand like why we put so much time, it's so much bigger than that. And I just think it's all about being compassionate and taking care of each other it's about making this country a lot better. And I mean, also to so many tourists that come, you know, they really care about the way a country takes care of its animals. And if we can be seen as like ahead of other nations and other, you know, that it's like an attraction, like, wait, wow, the Bahamas is so conscious about its animals. Like, I think that can only benefit us. So I don't know, I guess that's my little piece. <laughs> No, that was great. That was actually really great. Because, um, and just to take a spin, I know a lot of times people say that the way you can tell that someone's going to be like a serial killer is the way they treat animals, right? Because they'll start off by killing animals. So, guys, let's be compassionate. <laughs> and Bonnie, your final thoughts? Um, this this place, this is such an amazing place. I, you know, having grown up in the united states and coming you know and coming to the bahamas as an adult to work this is we have a really unique opportunity here living on the island i've been in, really interested in island biogeography and studying you know island you know island populations and conservation and in speciation events on islands for a really long time we have a really really awesome unique opportunity where we actually are live in a place where we can create effective change in a small amount of time you know a program like ours we are going to see the impacts in the next five years for sure in the next 10 years trying to do a program like this in the united states <laughs> it would just be i mean you could there, there are already so many programs in this in the United, like this in the United States, but it's just so huge. And there's, 
you know, places aren't contained. Animals can, you know, are going all over the place and crossing borders and whatnot. So the impact, it's still there, but it's not as visible. Whereas we, I feel like we have this really unique, amazing place that we live in where what we do is going to have a greater impact in a shorter amount of time. Um, and we can see how amazing that's going to be. So to everyone out there, be the change you want to see. You know, if you, if you're not happy with something, do something about it. And do you know what someone else might see you doing it or talk about what you're doing, share your experience and you're going to find the other like-minded people. And now there's five of you and you're, impacts going to it's not going to be it's not just going to be fivefold it's probably going to be tenfold when you're working together so yeah you know take your passions and and run with them and let's all work together and make this you know the bahamas even more amazing than it already is better better it's better in the bahamas and it'll be better better <laughs> but i definitely and as i was telling my guests before this show i actually definitely will make some time to come and volunteer with you guys stay away from the needles <laughs> but definitely um i think it's important and so anyone listening you if you don't have enough to donate financially everyone has some time you can take an hour or two hours out of your day your weekend to go out and support and really, like she said, be the change you want to see because a country, moral of the country is based by shooting of animals. We got some two, two Gandhi quotes. Um, but thank you guys so much for riding this wave with me. Thank you guys to my beautiful guests for coming on. Thank you to all my viewers. This is the last episode of the season and I will let my guests say goodbye as we sign on out. Bye. Oh. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we're so excited to see what you have in store for us next season, Lashanti. Definitely. And Laura. Thank you so much, Thank you so much Lashanti. It's amazing. We really appreciate your time. For Thank sure. you. We'll be in touch. You guys will see, see more of me in person. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great Sunday.